well, not too long after we, well, a few weeks, but still, um, maybe a month, uh, we got announcements that the home console versions of GoldenEye 007 are coming for um, Nintendo's Expansion Pass and Microsoft's Game Pass. It is time to finally cover GoldenEye and see how it holds up with issue 99 of Nintendo Power for August of 1997. GoldenEye is on the cover, as it should be. In the letters column, we have more suggestions for issue 100. Um, some of the good ones we haven't gotten before. Uh, best Pass Scores for their Arena column, which was their, which is the new iteration on their High Score column, which I haven't been covering very much. Uh, an Expanded Insider Update a add-on guide with the uh, best tips from Counselor's Corner and classified information. They say all the tips, but a best of is a pretty good version as well in terms of like a um, insert or something bundled with it in a poly bag or that sort of thing. In the power charts, we have several returning titles for all three platforms. Uh, Super Mario Land 2, Donkey Kong Land 3, and Wario Land on the Game Boy, Super Mario World 2 on the SNES, and GoldenEye on the N64. And speaking of GoldenEye, we have the cover game with notes on the various aspects of play and maps of the first six levels of the game with fairly detailed notes. Additionally, while the article does take some steps to preserve some of the twists from the source material, um, like the true identity of Janice, even though the game, ha the film has been out for some time, but I also at this point, like, I don't think it was out on home video yet. So these are twists that still could have been something that could have been spoiled if you hadn't uh, seen the film in theaters yet. GoldenEye 007 does right what a lot of FPS games on the N64 this far have done wrong. It provides the needed tools for precision aiming that Turok needed but didn't have. It has the movement that Hexen needed but didn't have. It also doesn't give me motion sickness, which Doom 64 did. Is it without flaws? Of course it's not. Uh, it's a game where some of the early missions try to present and encourage stealth by giving you silenced weapons, a silenced pistol, and a silenced sniper rifle, so you could theoretically um, drop guards without alerting um, everybody and setting off the alarms. But on the other hand, there's also no like way to duck behind cover um, outside of like actually standing things in the environments. Like, there's stuff on the on the ground that would have been used as cover if you had a crouch. Um, but instead of serving as protection, uh, or something you duck behind while you reload, they just exist to, well, serve as an obstacle to your movement. The game also tries to do the ambidextrous thing by having the D-pad and C buttons both handle movement. But again, because the game kind of heavily relies on the A and B buttons for actions and switching weapons and that sort of thing, and those are all on one side of the controller. Once again, the N64 kind of screws up. We have a preview of Mischief Makers, a 2.5D styled platformer from Enix in their, in their first big release for the N64 in the US at this point, and developed by Treasure, who previously had been a um, stalwart for the Sega Genesis. We have a preview of the title with no formal mechanical information or level maps or anything like that yet. It's a promising preview, it looks good, but I'm gonna hold off on the review for now. Next up is Multi Racing Championship, a racing game published by Ocean and developed by Genki and Imagineer. This looks like something of a semi-simulationist lap-based racing game with the players racing in various stripes of rally cars and a few different types of trucks. We have maps of several of the game's tracks. Multi-Racing Championship is kind of actually more of a hybrid arcade racing game. Um, hybrid arcade, hybrid simulationist. It, on the simulationist side is less related to parts, more related to um, precision tuning your vehicles for the various tracks and that sort of thing to get the best times out of it. Um, and it needing, needing to do that to really excel at the game. On one hand, and on the other hand, on the arcade style, instead of being just a straight lap-based racing game, you're also chasing a counting down one-minute timer, like with games like Daytona, Daytona USA or um, Cruising USA or that sort of thing. 
you know, point to point racing games. Well, Doki Daytona is lap based, but point stands. And so, yeah, you, so you have to reach each checkpoint before the timer kicks down, and the timer regains some time, but not a full amount of time when you reach each checkpoint. Now, if this was based on an arcade racer, I could forgive it something regarding the, the uh, checkpoint nonsense. Yeah, that works in a rally style game, and particularly a point to point racing game, and one in an arcade, but it is less conductive for a lap racer designed for home consoles. And so that's frustrating on that point. Second, the vehicle handling is kind of squirrely. Um, the drifting never quite works as well as I'd like. And while with some careful car choice and that sort of thing, I was able to make it to like the top three, the bottom of the top three. But I was never actually able to make it to number one, and that's what the game requires you to reach in order to advance and tracks and that sort of thing, you know, progress and complete the game. All in all, this is a game that could have been really solid, but instead it's something of a wash. I might, on my own time, try playing this with Game Shark cheats to get around the time limits, but not particularly play it necessarily. 100% straight. In the classified information column, we have more cheats for Shadows of the Empire and Mega Man X. We also have a Star Fox article article with more strategies for Star Fox 64, this time on how to get the gold medals for several of the levels. Our next N64 game is Tetrisphere, which is what if Tetris, but 3D. We have notes on the game mechanics along with the various gameplay modes. Tetrisphere is an interesting twist on Tetris, putting the game in a top-down perspective instead of a 3D environment. The added ability to move blocks around once you clear spaces instead of being limited to just dropping blocks. Additionally, the game puts a focus on height matching and like clearing by row. I'd almost barely call it Tetris, or not the game of the Tetris shapes. And yes, there's Panel de Pawn getting released as a tag without using any at all, but the point still stands. It's a fun puzzle game. My frustration with it is it gives you only three slip-ups um, per level or it, um, it gives you a game over and it's not great about say giving ways for you to replenish your lost your lost um, slip ups or lost mistakes the blast core comic continues well I, or i should say concludes with the team saving the first town before wrapping the story we have a 3D remake of Robotron 2084 from Midway with Robotron 64. We have gameplay notes for the mechanics, various modes of play. Robotron 64 plays remarkably well using the N64 controller with the D-pad handling movement and the C buttons handling shooting. Now this would work just as well as this. Again, D-pad and face buttons in that case. This version handles it feels like it handles the movement and orientation of the camera to present the space of the game level and the both enemies and uh, obstacles that you can't necessarily shoot um, very well. It also hands out a lot of one-ups very quickly to keep the player going rather than the original arcade game which wants to empty your wallet with um, because it's an arcade game and it wants your quarters. Our one Super Nintendo title, our first one in a while, is Brunswick World Tournament of Champions, a bowling game. We have information on the various oil patterns that can be on the uh, lane, and one of the different players you can play as, and different tournaments you can choose from. I mentioned the show previously that whether, uh, or as far as my criteria for whether a sports game is any good is, I be better at this sport in a video game than I personally am when I play the real thing. Now, I am, by no stretch of the imagination, a bowler. But I've found I have a pretty good grasp of my skills as a bowler. Um, I'm not hitting strikes every time, 
but like I can get the ball down the lane and at least for the first ball and then set myself up for a 7-10 split and then whiff it right down the middle sort of or go with the gutter at the very end when I try to do something fancy but I I, I, I know my limitations I know what what I can do and I can't even accomplish that in this game um particularly because the game doesn't provide any useful feedback on how to improve that game. It doesn't tell you what you're doing wrong and causing it the game to causing the ball to swing the gutter or that sort of thing. It feels like it would have been simple to take the free tap meter from golf games and sort of apply that here. Um, indicate where on the pins you want to put the ball and tap the button three times to set power and then the spin on the ball. First tap to start, second tap to indicate how much power, and the third tap indicating how much spin or whether it's a game that goes straight or trying to have a hook right. It doesn't do that though because it has this like second side gauge for handling spin and it doesn't necessarily indicate well how much spin you're actually doing. Making for a game where the bowling here is as executed is just kind of crap and makes it an unfun experience to play. Moving into Game Boy titles, Ken Griffey Jr.'s Major League Baseball has gotten a Game Boy port and it looks like it has the full array of teams. We have a few little gameplay notes as well, but since we're running to the end of the Game Boy's life, let's take a look at, again and see how this first party baseball game has evolved. Ken Griffey Jr. Baseball on the Game Boy does try to provide quality of life steps towards fixing the biggest problems that Game Boy Baseball games have. Fielding. It tries to indicate where the ball is going to land and shifts control in the game to whatever player is closest to the ball. The problem being is there's a distinct input lag that means that I felt when playing the game that ultimately meant that I have the store still the core problem of AI fielders being able to quickly and easily get right under the ball for easy outs and pop flies, while the human fielders are out of are out of position, in some cases way out of position, and ultimately end up moving like they're waiting for molasses. This is without getting into some of the problems with batting and that sort of thing. Also an odd delay in like the transition between each pitch as well, which is Counselor's Corner, we have more tips for Donkey Kong Country 3 and also for Shouts the Empire. Our last game of the issue is Tetris Plus, a Game Boy version of Tetris that's tweaked and now with a more involved puzzle mode. So Tetris Plus's puzzle mode is something I want. It combines a pre-built puzzle mode with levels with blocks already in place, in some cases in specific shapes. With the player's objective in this case being in the sort of lemmings like spin, get your pith helmeted explorer at the bottom of the level, clearing Tetris lines from their way with the, this rebuilt series of patterns. As time goes on, a spiked ceiling is going to slowly descend toward the bottom, and if the ceiling hits the explorer, it's game over. It's a clever concept, but with a few problems. First off, the blocks, at least after the first continue, if not from the get go, are still determined at random. It means you can still potentially run into an unwinning situation where you are being given a series of blocks that does not get you what you need to clear the field enough before your explorer reaches his doom. Speaking of which, the explorer is always going to climb to the highest point on the board, no matter how much time is remaining, and no matter if you've cleared a path now that the explorer could take to the bottom. Which this leads to a situation where you can run out of room very quickly, not due to lack of time on the clock, because also these levels are timed, but due to the explorer's own stupidity. But the thing is, again, the top of the structure doesn't stop the ceiling, or also it doesn't trigger a game over when it makes contact either. The top row of blocks will crunch away at the same rate of advancement if once the once the spike ceiling reaches it. So it's just all that really matters is the floor. 
And for that matter, the ceiling doesn't impact your ability to maneuver and place pieces either. So all that matters is the explore. It's all kind of frustrating, and it makes for a much less enjoyable experience than what this game has been. This game also did get a PlayStation release too, and that one's a little nicer. Um, but both versions of the game use password support um, for handling your progression. That works somewhat on the Game Boy, less so on the PlayStation 1, which has, you know, memory cards. Anyway, in the now playing column, we still have no also rans. Um, it's still the stu just the stuff we've covered in this issue already. In Pack Watch, we get a look at Conker's Quest the upcoming mascot platformer from uh, Rare, or ostensibly off upcoming, but it never actually comes out. Instead, we get Conker's Bad Fur Day, which is something very different. Wrapping up the issue, we have our E3 report. This is the Atlanta year for E3, and we get some notes on the lineup, or at least for the Nintendo side of things. Hyping up the N64 as the biggest console of all time, hyping up Midway as the biggest arcade publisher of all time, and I feel like I need to cut up, get cut up in Next Gen Magazine because I'm getting a real, getting high on their own supply vibe from Nintendo's spiel here. Again, reminder, around this point, Final Fantasy VII's coming out. Um, the PlayStation is the console for RPGs. So Nintendo still got some really good stuff. I mean, GoldenEye is absolutely nothing to sneeze at, but they are not big man on campus anymore, a big man in industry anymore. And the E3 report is talking like, as far as Nintendo's position and market share and everything goes, literally nothing has changed. Uh, Nintendo rules everyone else rules, which is patently false. My pick of the issue is unsurprising in this case, GoldenEye 007. Um, it's honestly a tremendous innovation on the of the first person shooter for this con for the N64 and consoles in general at this point. We do have like several other really good titles here, but frankly, GoldenEye stands out the most, and it's now become significantly more accessible with again the upcoming release for Xbox Live Game Pass and Nintendo Expansion Pass. Different features in each version. Uh, Xbox Live has um, high def graphics, N64 version, or, or the, 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 the more closer to the N64 version on the Switch also has multiplayer. So you got your choice. But either way, if you want GoldenEye, you have some real options now. Um, Hopefully this will also bring down some of the prices for um, GoldenEye cartridges that and some of the, the collector bubble deflating a bit as well. Alternatively, uh, Tetrisphere is a, pretty, is a pretty decent game as well. Um, and actually, like, of our, of our N64 games this issue, they're all pretty solid except for the racing game. Um, I even liked the uh, Robotron uh, game here as well. Next month, though, is the biggie, or potentially an even bigger biggie, with issue number 100. We'll see how Nintendo rings in the 100th issue of their, of their house organ. We'll see you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.